So recently I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, and I did kind of a little book report on that and did a video on that. So um, what I talked about today, you might be interested in watching that video first. So um, the book I read more recently was Tom Reagan's The Case for Animal Rights, and that is what I'm gonna be talking mostly about today. But I'm gonna be kind of doing that in comparison with Peter Singer's book, because the reason I read these books at all was um, I had seen a lot of stuff going around on YouTube um, talking about Peter Singer is kind of like this evil wizard who only cares about, you know, like, oh, he just wants to give animals bigger cages so they're just a little bit more comfortable, but he's not really interested in anything else other than that. And that Tom Reagan is kind of like the knight in shining armor and he wants to give all animal animals their rights and, you know, that we should be fighting for the rights of all animals. So I was curious at first because Peter Singer's book is called Animal Liberation and I thought that, that was kind of weird that somebody who believed in animal liberation would just want them in bigger cages. And so that, that kind of piqued my interest. And so that's why I'm reading these two books. So um, just to kind of give a little um, perspective here, Peter Singer's book was published in 1975 and was updated um, most recently through the years in 2009. And Tom, Tom Reagan's book was published in 1983, so a little while, a few years after Singer's book, and updates through 2004. The other thing is, is there's quite a bit of difference in who the intended audience is for these two books. Um, Animal Liberation um, goes into, is kind of more for, you know, just your regular aver average reader. And so it goes into detail about, you know, the situation of animals um, in his what he's looking at specifically uh, animal research and animals on farms. And then he even goes into, um, you know, detail about how you, you might change your life um, in order to help those animals, you know, so like changing your diet or whatever. And so he's really looking at kind of your, your average reader. And um, Tom Reagan's book is, uh, he actually, talk specifically about who his audience is. Um, let's just go, go to this. He says, um, on the one hand, I wanted to write a book that would be accessible to all those who labor for the cause of the better treatment of animals, persons who, for the most part, have professions other than academic philosophy. Um, and then he said, on the other hand, I hope to write a book that would command the attention of my professional peers in philosophy. Um, so, when you read through this book, it is definitely heavy, heavy on the philosophy and um, talking in terminology um, that, you know how you read some books and it, it's using new terminology that maybe you don't use, that you don't know. And so, and then they keep using that terminology and, you, and they don't re-explain it. And so you have to go back and, and read again, well, what did that mean? You know, his is kind of on the other end of the spectrum where he explains things like over and over so much that it's almost like watching paint dry, you know, <laughs> you're just like, yep, okay. But I mean, it's nice that he airs on that side of over explaining. Um, and so you can read through this and, and kind of get through it and understand what he's saying. One thing I didn't like about this book is that much of it is because he is talking to his philosophical uh, counterparts, he or his philosophy peers, is that he's kind of in a little bit of a pissing match between, you know, he himself who's a deontologist and um, teleologists, or better known as like say consequentialists or utilitarians. And so there's a lot of, well, you think of it this way, but I would think of it this way all kind of pretty much kind of for the most part coming to the same conclusions. And so it's a little bit, it's a little bit annoying to have to, to read through that because I think that a lot of that effort is wasted. I think that what would be helpful with these two books is to talk about their conclusions. Um, obviously a person can use an ero erroneous argument to get to a conclusion, but um, I think that that is where 
the biggest hang up that I see out there with this information going around about Peter Singer and Tom Reagan is really a misunderstanding about what their conclusions are. And so I want to talk specifically about, um, you know, their conclusions. So let's do a real quick summarization of um, what Peter Singer says in Animal Liberation as far as what do you, um, how we should treat animals. So um, let's take a look at that real quick. So he had been talking about um, what Jeremy Bentham, a philosopher, had been saying about animals. And he said, in this passage, Bentham point points to the capacity for suffering as the vital characteristic that gives a being the right to equal consideration. The capacity for suffer suffering, or more strictly, for suffering and or enjoyment or happiness is not just another characteristic like the cap capacity for language or higher mathematics. And so that is what he bases his um that is the scope of of the animals that he believes re, um require moral consideration the whole spectrum of animals anything that can suffer or enjoy ha you know life or happy have happiness those those animals should be given moral consideration so essentially he's saying any animal that is sen sentient and um and then he um, he talks about um, kind of some except maybe some exceptions um, to when would you when would you ever disregard that? And um, you know he talks about in animal experiments there might be a situation where like if you had one animal uh, that could be tested. And it could save like millions of people from dying of leukemia or something like that. Then you might consider doing that. He said the one test would be, would you do it to a human being who was, who had the same capacity as that animal, like say a rabbit or a dog or something? Um, would you do that to like a comatose human? Would you test on them? And that would be kind of your test of whether you ought to be able to do it or not. So he talks about those extreme exceptions. And the other thing he talked about, um, something I talked about in my previous video was um, what if a, an animal doesn't have a capacity to know, understand its whole, its life and, you know, it lives just day to day in its exist in a day to day existence. What if you were to kill it? Um, painlessly, um, would that be morally acceptable? Because it, you know, um, and um, he says that seems strange and um, talks about some things that, uh, why, he, why we wouldn't want to do that. And, um, and one of the things he says is that you couldn't do it on the scale that we kill and eat animals today. You couldn't do it on a factory farm level. You it may be able to do something like that on individual little farms. You know, it wouldn't be at the level that we do it now. And so he kind of discussed those kinds of things. Um, and so people would think, well, golly, he's, you know, making these exceptions where we can do these things to animals. You know, um, obviously he, he, he isn't so far that he's all, all Peter Singer wants is animals in bigger cages, but, but he does, he is making these, ex these exceptions that allow animals to be used in, possibly in certain situations. And, and in fact, Tom Reagan, while we think that he's in his book, The Case for Animal Rights, he thinks that all animals should have, have rights. Well, in fact, that is not true. Um, he has a very limited, um, under, uh, he's putting forward a very limited argument about the scope of what animals should be given rights. And so, um, so he said, I'll just read this whole thing here. He says, my position, roughly speaking, may be summarized as follows. Some non-human animals resemble normal humans in morally relevant ways. In particular, they bring the mystery of a unified psychological presence to the world. Like us, they possess a variety of sensory, cognitive, cognitive, and volitional capacities. They see and hear, believe and desire, remember and anticipate, plan and intend. Moreover, what happens to them matters to them. Physical pleasure and pain, these they share with us. 
but also fear and contentment, anger and loneliness, frustration and satisfaction, cunning and imprudence. Uh, these and a host of other psychological states and dispositions collectively help define the mental life and relative well-being of those, in my terminology, subjects of a life. We know better as raccoons and rabbits, beaver and bison, chipmunks and chimpanzees, you and I. Line, draw line drawing challenges arise for anyone who believes that not all animals are subjects of a life. Amoeba and Parmesia, for example, are in the world but are not aware of it. Um, so he goes on to say, then the line I draw is mentally normal mammals a year or more. So, uh, and then he goes on to say, having explained these matters, I go to some length to make it as clear as possible, um, as I possibly can, that other sorts of animals might be subjects of a life. In my most recent writings, in fact, I argue that we have abundant reason to think that birds are and that fish may be. And so uh, when he's talking in this book about animal rights, he is referring only to mammals of, a, of age, year or more. He is not in this book talking about birds or fish, although he's saying that it could, it could apply to them, but he's not arguing that in this book. And um, also to go on, um, he says, uh, what the rights view denies, at least in its current articulation, is that plants and insects are subjects of a life. And it denies as well that these forms of life have been shown to have any rights, including a right to survival. So bees, no, they're insects and they, they aren't subjects of a life and so they don't have rights. So um, I just wanna make that clear because I think that folks think there is this thing out there that Tom Reagan believes that all animals have rights and um, that's not the case. He believes that mammals a year, one year of age and older um, have rights and maybe some others do, but he's not arguing for that and certainly um, certainly uh, insects don't. And so as far as vegans looking to Tom Reagan as the guy that's, um, you know, advocating veganism in his argument here, that's not what he's doing. So, um, so he, um, where Singer d does kind of a simple argument, he says animals feel pain, they enjoy pleasure. Um, and so, we, sh we need to give them moral consideration just as we would any other human being that had the same capacity, had developmental disabilities or whatever that gave them the similar capacity of an, another animal. Um, let's, let's look at this equally. Tom Reagan goes through kind of a much longer um, set of steps talking about uh, establishing the fact that animals have desires, beliefs, and going through a long set of steps to, to say, um, these animals have rights. And when I say that, he's talking again about mammals age one or older. And um, so then because he's limited his ar his argument or his coverage or his scope to these animals, you know, because kind of, I guess our intuitions tell us, well, gosh, what about the other animals? Or we want to um, protect the other animals how does he, he, he handle those exceptions? So he talks about, let's just read here. Finally, it will be protested that some farm animals, most notably chickens and turkeys, are not mammals. And so given the rights view position regarding those animals who are subjects of a life, fall outside the scope of the principles prescribed in this view. He says, okay, well, I'll go on and kind of talk about that a little bit later. So what he does is kind of patches up his argument to try and, you know, give those animals some sort of protection. And what he does here is, um, let's see here. He says, a great deal that is morally significant turns on whether an individual is conscious and can experience pain. Because we are uncertain where the boundaries of consciousness lie, it is not unreasonable to advocate a policy that bespeaks moral caution. Then he also says, um, talking about Immanuel Kant's um, um, arguments, um, is that cruelty to animals ought to be discouraged, not because we owe it to animals themselves not to be cruel to them, but because people who are cruel to animals develop habits of cruelty that in time leads them to mal maltreat human beings. 
And so we're not going to treat animals well just for their sake, but because it makes it might make us bad people. And actually, that's an argument that in Singer's book, he um, he, he brings up, too, when he's talking about, well, should we kill animals? They don't know some some of these animals may not they don't live day to day. If we could kill them painlessly, should we do it? And he says, well, maybe because we should think about how if we're doing something that's unnecessary, what kind of person will that turn us into? But he says, but we can't really prove that that's going to make us bad people. So um, he kind of passes along and goes past that argument and says, well, um, you couldn't on the scale that we do today, um, raise and kill animals and that they live their natural lives and they're killed painlessly. That's not possible on that scale. And so maybe we could allow, maybe it would be morally allow, allowable on a very small scale. Um, but he actually doesn't feel that there's a lot to stand. I don't, I, I don't think as far as Tom Reagan's saying, well, it will make us It'll make us bad, maybe bad people and maybe bad to other human beings if we treat animals that way who are outside of the scope of what he is is covering as far as animal rights. So the one thing that you might see here in the case for animal rights is like, well, this is different, is his exceptions, his extreme exceptions. Um, you know, you, we've talked about Singer, how he said, well, you might experiment on one animal if it's going to save a million people from leukemia or something like that. Um, and people say, well, um, Reagan doesn't believe in that. That's actually, he tries to kind of skinny out of that. Um, but it doesn't appear to me that he actually does that successfully. He talks about like the extreme situations of like, a dog in a boat full of people, a lifeboat, and who do you check off if there's not room or if there's not enough food? And in fact, he says, you know, check off the the dog. Or amongst humans, he talks about miners in a cave. Um, it's just one of, of a couple of examples he gives. And there's one that, and there's one stuck in this side of the cave and there's a bunch of others over here. You have to kill this one in order to save the others. Well, he says, yeah, let's go ahead and, and do that. So I'm not going to go into the details of why he explains that. He, he, he explains, well, I'm looking at this, at this differently than Singer would. Um, but they do essentially kind of come to the same conclusions. So anyway, um, that's just to clear up. I think that is a, um, a misunderstanding out there that um, Tom Reagan is the knight in shining armor and that he believes in rights for all animals. Uh, and uh, one thing that he did bring up that I, I thought was interesting um, and made me think about both of these folk, both of these fellows writing these books is that he, he, he goes on to say after he said that, you know, my argument doesn't include, um, it includes mammals, it certainly doesn't include insects. Um, he said, environmental philosophers in general, including the most distinguished among them, will not be satisfied with the environmental implication of the rights view. Whether argumented by principles of compensatory justice or not, they will say, and in fact, some have said, that species have inherent value. And so do ecosystems and the biosphere. Um, he says, which is how we should account for our obligations to save endangered species, including plants and insects, not just fuzzy mammals. To which I can only make the following response. It is not enough to confer inherent or intrinsic value on species, ecosystems, or the biosphere. One wants a compelling argument for doing so. Not only has this not been done, for reasons I have given elsewhere, I believe it cannot be done. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's just kind of curious to me that um, both of these philosophers are kind of looking at, you know, like, and, and philosophers in the past have kind of um, taken our scope of um, who will, who will, will we give moral consideration and, and we open it up and we allow different races in. Okay. White people only. No, no, we'll, we'll, 
allow other races in. And then we like, okay, well, women, we'll allow women in. And then we like, now we're saying, okay, well, maybe animals, maybe they need to be giving moral consideration, not necessarily the right to vote, but um, moral consideration, you know, depending on their each of their natures, right? And I just kind of keep thinking to myself, like, why don't we, why don't we um, include in our moral consideration rivers and soil and plants and things like that and, and ecosystems and species? Um, and I agree with him. You can't just say, well, I feel like it. You know, there has to be some ar argument for it. But I would say that there, there, there must be an argument for that. Um, and if we were to look at it like, why do, um, just don't do, just don't harm something or, uh, damage something unnecessarily. And of course, then you say, well, what is harm? And you can argue about what is damage and what is unnecessary, what is necessary. But I mean, if we were to look at it that way, then we would be less inclined to, um, dump pesticides, um, and herbicides on our ground and, um, put waste into our rivers and not just because, oh, well, it affects us and our, it affects our quality of life, but actually looking at the river and the soil and the air as having, um, value in itself. And, um, I think that we need to take up that challenge of forming an argument for that because rather than just slowly allowing each of these little groups into this um, moral sphere, um, let's look at it all as something that has moral relevance. And um, anyway, yeah, uh, I suppose that it's, it's kind of maybe it's necessary to make slow incremental steps and to slowly look, you know, now we're at this point where we might look at animals um, and say, shouldn't we be given these, these animals moral consideration and that we just have to go through those small steps. So I don't, um, I don't disagree with uh, what they're doing here. It's just that I, it just makes, seems to make more sense to me that we would just open everything up to moral consideration and just not harm or damage something unnecessarily. Anyway, there you go. It's worth reading. It's a slog, but it's worth knowing what he has to say.